Larry Ukmanowitz. And you're watching the Break It Down Break show. It down. Yes. And you're yes. watching the Break It Down show. Let me, do you want to do it again? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. All right. Larry Ukmanowitz, and you're watching the Break It Down show. That's right. That's I got right. my buddy, uh, Larry Ukmanowitz. He, he, so here's why uh, uh, Larry's important is he was a first sergeant when I was in Delta Company 165th in Germany. And why is that important? Well, one of the things that's going on is Mike Guardi is writing a book about the history of our deployment to Bosnia that happened in 1996. So leading up into that, uh, Larry was either our first sergeant or acting sergeant major along the way. So he's got a lot of, of uh, stories about all of the different people. But also, this is an interesting thing. When we, and, and I'm going to let Larry talk in a second, but in 1995, the Army was kind of reconfiguring what counterintelligence, there was used to be a job called MDCI, multidiscipline counterintelligence. That was out the door. They shut that company down. And it was really just us, an infantry company, an interrogator company, and then a headquarters company in our battalion. And even the interrogators were being shrunk down to the point where they had to be housed in our company because their company was rolled up and folded away. And we were becoming uh, not a tactical asset, but a strategic asset. So we were going to have nine mils only. All this stuff was happening. And then we deployed to Bosnia. So I'm going to let shut up and Larry talk about that time. Well, so my work with Bosnia started three years before I got assigned to the 165th. People forget when that war started, um, this is, people don't know this, all of the beef that you had in the BX or the, or the commissary in Europe came from Yugoslavia, all of it. The nine millimeter rounds that we went to the range and shot in our Berettas, all of that, man, all of that ammo was manufactured in Yugoslavia. They were for all intents and purposes, a Western focused nation. They weren't part of NATO, but they were supplying us. You could travel as a as an intel asset. I couldn't go to East Germany. Well, I did, but that's part of what I did. A different, totally different story. We could talk for hours on that. But we couldn't go to Eastern Europe, but we could go vacation in Yugoslavia. People tend to forget that. So I was stationed, I was teaching at the Defense Language Institute. I was the, de the deputy associate dean. And the, the conflict started in, in uh, former Yugoslavia, and it started basically with Serbia and Croatia attacking each other up in the very northern part of the country and nothing to do with Bosnia. It was a full-out war between two countries that were fighting over, over the border between Serbia and Bosnia, uh, Serbia and, and Croatia and where that would be up on the Sava River. Um, at that time, the United States Department of Defense had no active duty Serbo-Croatian linguists anywhere. We didn't, they didn't exist. We had some reservists from Cleveland and other places, but there were no active duty people. So the Defense Language Institute's first mission was to stand up the ability to train linguists in, Ser in Serbo-Croatian. There were six instructors at DLI that were that were formerly in the Serbo-Croatian department, but, but being civil servants, they didn't fire them when they got rid of the department. They went off to do testing and other stuff. They had to reconstitute a Serbo-Croatian language group that had both Serbians and Croatians in it who didn't get along. And then they took up some of us, since I was running the Russian language school, and I already spoke Russian, Polish, and German. They took three of us and said, you're going to be the military language instructors for the new Serbo-Croatian program. So I went through a 16-week crash course in Serbo-Croatian Immediately upon graduate on that, I got sent to RAF Mildenhall to train the RC-135 crews that were going to start flying mission. So this is two years, three years before you got on that train. Were you on the train or on the planes? I don't know which one you were on. Uh, yeah, uh, with yeah, the, the bus and the Humvees. The bus. Okay, before you got on that bus, we have been involved for almost four years in that war and shaping our response to that war. And I was involved in quite a bit of that like I said, from a training perspective, um, to the point that when I left RAF Mildenhall after the training, as I was getting on the bus to head back to Heathrow, the first RC flight was going out to do their live mission with what we had just trained them to do. So it goes way, way, way back. Then in addition to that, there was planning going on at the Pentagon that predates your involvement. And then as it got into theater, when Fifth Corps got the mission, you, what, what you don't realize is once the, I can't even remember the dude's name that was our Sergeant Major. He was the guy with Tarot. Pardon? 
Drost. Drost. Yeah, was it Drost? Well, yeah. that was the battalion. Anyway, battalion. Yeah, battalion sergeant major. When he punched out and they put me in charge, I had to go to all those core level meetings. So what you guys never saw was the high level, here's our mission. And it's interesting in that when you had your conversation with Eric Kleinsmith, you guys were talking about risk and all this kind of stuff. And I remember screaming at my radio or at my, I had this little boast in there, I listened to it, screaming, I go, that's not, you got it, it's not the mission. The mission was to show up. It's like Woody Allen says, you know, 90% of life is showing up. That was our mission. The war was over when we got there. It's what we did before we got there that was what stopped the war. We didn't go there to fight. We went there to make sure nobody else fought. So yeah, it was a very frustrating mission. It's not a mission we were designed to do. It's not a mission we were in place to do, but hell, we're the United States Army. We can do whatever the hell we want, you know? So we went down there and sat. Um, that was the mission. Incredibly frustrating mission. I get it, but that was the mission. Yeah. And that's that's a something that people just don't quite grasp. Whereas you went into, um, you, you were later on, you were in uh, Afghanistan, right? Okay, live mission. Shooting at people, they're shooting at you. Way different way of looking at the world. That was not the mission in Bosnia. Yeah, the, the mission in Bosnia uh, definitely ended up being, in retrospect, very safe. If you didn't go mess around with mines, you didn't drive off the road, you know, it was, it was relatively safe. I'm going to let you talk in a second, but I didn't know that going in. And, and uh, I want to say this to you before you talk, and I'm going to let you talk as long as you want. The, um, you gave us the, some of the best pre-deployment training by simply explaining Yugoslavia and the history. You're like, go back a hundred years, go back 400 years, go back 600 years. And it was like, Oh, this is a mess. There are Bosnian, Serbs who have a Croat grandma. I mean, like this, and everybody had gone through there. So that was really invaluable. It was among the best bits of training we got because a lot of the training, as you said, we just weren't really built to do this. And the other thing I wanted to say in terms of um, the the threat when we were there, we for sure didn't have enough stuff. We had like four or five people. Most of us have nine mils to drive around. And uh, so when we're out there doing it, you're like, man, this is, if this goes sideways, it goes sideways real fast. Real fast. So here's the other piece of that. If you recall, I got you guys down there, Command Sergeant Major. Vivon, to his credit, made sure I got an, an NCOER as a Command Sergeant Major, so I got credit for it, which got me promoted, which was nice. Um, but you recall when the, when the new Sergeant Major came in, he took one look around at the way I was working with all of you and he got rid of me. He basically kicked me off the base. He did not want me. I was, I was like for two weeks, I was the first sergeant of headquarters company. And then he realized this was not going to work because everyone in the battalion was coming to me and not to him. And he realized this wasn't, and he was right. And I, you know, I even told him, I said, this is, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna not help these guys, but so he sent me off to the Allied Military Intelligence Battalion in Split for the last six months of my deployment down there. And we had no rules at all. We could do whatever we wanted, go wherever we wanted, including to Tuzla, Maine, without all the battle rattle, go anywhere we wanted, do whatever we wanted. We did actually collect incredible amounts of information. We knew, we knew where all of the so our, our main focus was, there were two. One was um, the uh, madrasas that had been opened by the Saudis uh, were a big bone of contention and they were all down in the Travnik area where I was around the Turkish, the Turkish battalion. The Turks were protecting them. So that was one of our focuses. And then our other focus was on the, because of the area we were in, all of the Bosnian Serbs, and it's important for your audience to understand there's Bosnian Serbs, there's Bosnian Croats, and then there's Bosnian Muslims. And Croats look at Bosnian Croats as like we look at, at uh, Appalachia. You know what I mean? They're hillbillies. The Serbs look at Bosnian Serbs the same thing. Those are just a bunch of hillbillies out there. That's not the way they think. The Bosnian Serbs think they're, they're Serbs and the Bosnian Croats think they're Croats, but the other two countries don't really think of them that way. But anyway, we, we knew where every Bosnian Serb leader up to including Blažić and Karadžić, we knew where they were, we knew where their girlfriends were, we knew what businesses they owned, we knew where they were. All Clinton had to do or whoever was in charge was say, pick them up and we could have got them. No questions asked. Norpol Battalion knew where they were. We, we had 
we had that country wired. You guys were almost a, I don't even want to say a distraction, but you were like a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You were an important part of what we're doing, but you were like the overt part of what we're doing so that they see us and they see what we're doing and they see who we're talking to. And then we could monitor with, you know, listening and other things, we could monitor their reaction to you showing up to a village in somewhere and walking into a coffee shop or walking into some Goomba warlord's bar that he owns that he's running his hookers out the back. You know, your guys would go into those kind of places. Now, granted, I remember doing that was incredibly painful. I, I'll tell you one, here's, here's my last anecdote. Um, Alex Trebek came to Bosnia to do yes, um, yes. Jeopardy. And I had tried three times to try out for Jeopardy where he had come to places in Europe, uh, RF Milton Hall when I was there. I could never get in because the line was too long or whatever. I arranged, I was a Sergeant Major Battalion, I could do what I wanted. I arranged for a four person convoy to go from our base at, at Lukovac to Tuzla, Maine to do that. And our asshole brigade commander called an emergency meeting for the same time and I couldn't go. I was so pissed off. But I had to arrange a four vehicle convoy. It's what, eight soldiers plus security just to go try out for frickin' Jeopardy. That's what I had to do. <laughs> and I never got there. That's so funny. I do. I remember when that happened. There was a long line of people. And if I remember correctly, nobody qualified for the show. I would have. It could have been you. I you I would have. When, okay, so here's a question I have. So, and I, I don't know how this works, but when you guys say, okay, this is really going to happen, and we have this, this goofy conglomeration of a unit, right? Like mm -hmm. interrogators and counterintelligence people aren't by design supposed to deploy as a team because we're, we're sibling jobs, but, but we do dramatically different things. So, who came up with this idea? And then how on earth did these teams, we deployed with no functioning radio, right? So how did you guys decide on the teams? So th what happened was we realized because this wasn't a fighting conflict, the interrogation role probably wouldn't exist, just wouldn't be there. So at best they would be ancillary support or at best they would speak server Croatian and they could act as interpreters. At worst, they would just be ancillary support to your CI teams to do whatever they drive, uh, radio op, do whatever they need to do, because you've got to have that, that sort of back. That was the plan. Um, and you know as well as I do, the interrogators, well, this is true of any, any MOS anywhere, there's various levels of intelligence and, and uh, commitment and um, competence, right? So we tried to match, believe it or not, we did. We tried to match the strong interrogators with the weak, uh, and you had some weak warrant officers and the strong warrant officers with the weak interrogators. You guys on the intel on the CI team, you handle you know the you the, your warrant officer team. They they handled all that. We didn't deal with that. But the inter the interrogators that assigned we absolutely at the battalion level assigned them individually to those teams to make sure that from at least from our perspective they could help and not hurt. That was the goal. Um, but you're right. There was no, there was no standard interrogation mission. So, another story, just as an aside. You yeah. can cut this out later if you want to. Um, I've been monitoring the Ukrainian conflict in Ukrainian and in Russian. So I've been listening to RT, which is the Russian propaganda network, and I believe it's called UAT, which is the Ukrainian version of that. Um, and one of the things that UAT put out on there, and it's if you Google um, Russian prisoner interrogation, what happens is, is there's a video out there of a Russian, of a Ukrainian interrogator interrogating a Russian soldier. In, and he's following, I guarantee you, it's what I learned how to do in 1979 as a Russian interrogator, the exact same questions. And they were eliciting answers. He was using a standard fear up followed by peony up and it worked and he was yeah, 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 it's, out yeah, yeah, yeah. it's out there online yeah, yeah, yeah. it's Sorry. fascinating Sorry. because literally the questions he's asking i learned in russian in 1979 to interrogate russian prisoners on the battlefield and it works it freaking work here it is 40 years later and this shit works i'm amazed <laughs> that's out there I'm putting the I'm link putting up for that right that now. Right so you, guys now. You, you found it? Yeah, it's on, yeah. It's on the screen. You guys can check that out. And, and Truly amazing. So.
my interrogator buddies out there that for 30, 40 years have said, this shit isn't going to work. Yes, it does. <laughs> it works exactly like they said it would. I want to ask you a, a first sergeant, sergeant major type question. Um, looking back uh, over all the times I've deployed and all the places I've gone, our pre-deployment training was bullshit. We didn't do anything. We constantly, one of the things we did, I think five times I can remember, we watched the winter driving video. And then someone would say, we lost a roster. We have to watch this again. We did not, we were, you know, we had a con ops team come down and do a con ops course. But in effect, a lot of us had no idea what we were doing and we didn't train up in a way that would make sense to me. Can you help me understand that? It was the best we could do at the time we had. Um, what was more important was to make sure the equipment would work when we got to country. So that's where the emphasis was. Believe it or not, the most important thing that we were told at core level that we had to do, and you probably went through this, was the dead driver drill. They, we knew back in 1990 the limitations of Humvees in terms of tactical vehicles, what they were good at, what they weren't good at. What they weren't good at is protecting people. The assumption we made is the drivers would get shot, so we needed to figure out a way to get a vehicle out of danger. Um, but other than that, it was more about equipment than it was about training. We just had to go with the training. We, you, your standard package of soldier training basically was going to get you 80% of the way there. We did the best we could with what we had and the time we had. You got to remember, we got the warning order. I remember we got the warning order. Well, we got the warning order back, I'd say, in November that, hey, this may happen. But we got the warning order to deploy. We were all at a party up at the club on a Saturday night right before Christmas. I think it was like the Friday before Christmas. We were just doing our typical doing stupid shit up at the club. And literally the message came that we all had to report to work the next day because we started to load out vehicles and we're going to move. So it happened pretty quick and we were in there in January. So uh, yeah, Yvonne and I were on, a, were on a plane, I think the day after Christmas or two days after Christmas. I don't remember. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. we were out there. We were gone. One of my favorite things about you. Well, so it, great. it was a matter of what did we have time to do and what, what would we get the most benefit from? Yeah, I, I, can I can understand that. Understand I know that. It's before I don't have a uh, top cover for what you guys were covering and everything. I just know that it would have been great to have more knowledge on how to actually um, discover and, and run sources. But either way, we, we figured it out on the fly. And luckily, uh, you know, the teams seem to, as long as, the, here's the thing, here's the thing that we needed. How do you, as a warrant officer, as, as an NCO, defend your team against your host? Because, boy, I'll tell you what, if that was the biggest thing to kill a team was a command that didn't get what we did to include our own. That almost happened to me. Um, I was at a meeting with a, with a warlord. I can't remember who it was, just some low-level schmuck. And we were in his bar with his hookers. And we had finished the meeting. We had gathered the information. We came. And you know as well as I do, it, it was the perfect human environment. There were three sides, all who hated each other. So they would rat each other out left, right, and center. It was beautiful for collecting info. But we were in there. Meeting's over. We're at the bar. We're drinking Rocky or whatever they, they drink. And, there's, and because I speak Serbo-Croatian fairly fluently, it, there was a, that was an odd thing for them. So I had a hooker sitting next to me, and she was like, oh, uh, it's so great that you speak the language. And so she says, well, how old are you? And I go, I was in my 30s, I'm like, ah, 34, 35. She goes, oh, you don't look 34, 35. She says, well, how old do you think I am? And I, she looks in her 40s. I thought ah, I'd be nice to her. I said, eh, 32. She just gives me this stony look and says, I'm 24. And she was used, very used, right? But the problem is, None of none of the, I was with a bunch of British guys and none of them knew what we were talking about at all. All they saw is she went from all smiles to not smiling and everyone else around her went from smiling to not smiling. And one of the guys I was with panicked and sort of reached down for his sidearm and they all reached for theirs. And I was like, well, no, no, everything's fine. No, no, don't, don't, don't panic. Everything's good. Relax. And we, we had to like back out of there, like, we're sorry, we're going, blah, blah, blah. And so I always say that whenever a woman now asks me how old they are, I fall on the floor and fake an epileptic seizure. I don't want to answer that question ever again. But that actually happens. Those are the kind of things that happened in real life out there. There's two uh, things. And it, because of a, you know, you, you say something stupid that gets, yeah. gets you sideways. 
there's two things there's I want to say about this. Say. One, one of the things is, is uh, what I was talking about was internal, like a U.S. commander, you know, who owns an, a CI asset, doesn't understand that we can drink, we need to leave the camp, we shouldn't be tied up doing extra details, defending ourselves against that. And then also, like you were saying, one sentence that as it goes out of your mouth, you're trying to grab it back, but you can't. It's that delicate at times when you're doing these really tricky conversations. Conversations. So we tried to get the commanders to let you guys go. We really did. Um, but that was never going to happen. That was the mission. The mission from core was you will not do that. So there were four levels above you where the commanders were like, sorry, the rules are you're not going to do that. Where I was with the with the allied MI battalion, we had none of those rules, so we could do that kind of stuff, which was a shame because it was great. <laughs> I, I promise we didn't I miss out. We didn't miss out. <laughs> oh no, yeah, I'm sure you had a good time, but I mean, we just the the to see a, a intelligence operation that actually works the way it's supposed to is pretty incredible. Um, I've seen them when they don't work; that is not incredible. And that's but I've seen them when they do work. So. One of the things that, the things uh, that I find uh, interesting is you look at, at, the, at the mission, and I know you, you have a different view on this because you've got the higher level thing, but th this wasn't about infantry. This wasn't about tanks. It wasn't about artillery. It really was about these teams going out day to day into the environment, you know, at least at the battalion tactical level. There was no other game in town that was more uh, impactful on the mission at, the, at that level, I, at least as far as I understand. Maybe there was something else, but it was definitely intel related. Yeah, no, there, it, it is, it was why we were there, but to the powers that be, if you've got a bunch of tanks and you've got a bunch of airplanes and you've got a bunch of troops, that's the weapon you got, that's the weapon you're going to use. Um, I mean, that, that's the nature of armies. They're wasteful in general, and we were just wasteful. <laughs> yeah. If you could have changed about our, about our predetermined training, what, what would you have changed? Um, I probably would have, well, as a linguist, I would have done more language training. I would have tried to get everyone, everyone up to speed, at least with standard politeness strategies, the ability to count to 10. I, I, one of, I, who was the female warrant that we had down there with us? I forget her name. Um, but she was really good. Um, I can't even remember her name now. But anyway, she came up to me once. We were there out in the field and she said, hey, we keep passing these signs that say pectopa. And she says, what the hell is that? And I said, no, that's restaurant. That's what it, she says. So pectopa means restaurant. And I had to explain to her the silver relic alphabet. And she went, oh, well, that makes sense because there's one in every village. I said, of course. <laughs> you know, and I started mentioning some of the other signs that they were seeing. And she's like, oh, yeah, so that's the bank and that's the this. And I'm like, ah, what do you want? It's, that's That level of language training should have been done. Nobody should have ever had to look at a sign and say, what the hell is that building? Um, especially if it's a restaurant. But um, I would have done that, first of all. Now, granted, that's pie in the sky, really. I doubt that would have ever really happened, but it would have been nice if it had. Um, the other thing that I would have done is um, I would have spent more time on the civil affairs side of it. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure how you guys related to the civil affairs team, but we, where I was in Croatia, it was I was in Bosnia, but it was the Croatian part of Bosnia. Um, we had a civil affairs team that were phenomenally good, that whenever we needed to know what was in that building or who lived here or what's in that factory or whatever, they knew because they were out every single day. They had a house in town in Travnik that they lived in. I lived on a, a base, a, a nice base, but it was a base. They were in town, in the middle of town, working. Um, they were all uh, executives with UPS, the whole team, which was interesting. So in addition to um, just being very good at civil affairs, they also had civilian experience running a huge multinational business to rely on, on how you deal with people. They were, they were amazing. The um, decision that we made as a military to put civil affairs in the reserve was a great idea. It really was. It's one of those things that that's what the reserves are for. That's what you want them for. I don't know if you guys had a team like that, but man, they were good. It was definitely, it was definitely something that a, a force multiplied for us. One of the, so I want to say this to, and to your credit, some of the best training we got pre-deployment was Larry up there giving us uh, phrases. He taught me to say, stoy, ruke uvis, 
And, and so the things like that, you also taught us how to say Dana Brzezinski's name three different ways. Cause we didn't know how the C worked because there wasn't the uh, mark on it to tell right. you Brzezinski, 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 or whatever those things were. But I remember that. <laughs> yeah. The, the ability to move around was a problem, right? So, so we were lucky in that the brigade that we were supporting and we were a general support team that was adopted by a, a, a commander, a brigade commander who was, you know, he was influential. So he's like, no, you're my guys, you know, and, and uh, because we gave them good products every day, you know, he let us pretty much do whatever we needed to do. But the, um, I, I guess, actually, I want to say something different too about that. Hmm. Let me think what I want to do. Anyhow, he he allowed us to go out every day, and that access was augmented by the PSYOPs teams and the civil affairs teams. So we could have, because we were in a cluster of camps, we had a two-vehicle convoy exempt, exemption that allowed us you know, some pretty good movement. We could also go on a foot patrol by ourselves, you know, which that wasn't really covered. But if we wanted to get rangy or we wanted to go out and be part of something else, it was the civil affairs and psyops teams. That would have been good to know in advance too. go look for these people. They'll be a good partner for what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, We also had people that were working on the uh, contractors. Um, You know, that we had a team that was devoted to them. That was okay. That, that gave us some information. That was more, salacious who's sleeping with who kind of information on the base rather than anything else but you know what the hell you collect what you collect <laughs> not useful in terms of the the, the mission but this doesn't apply to you because I, I thought you did a great job as a first sergeant for what i you know knew was an e4 but um uh, a lot of the 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 leadership in that battalion in that company was was pretty bad i had i think i had seven ncos my entire time in delta company and it was, it was like, I would get pushed around section to section. I don't know if you remember, but I was in pretty good shape. I shot straight. I self-developed. I went to boards, all that stuff. And then I would get bounced around, but never recommended for E5. Everybody got an excellent block for having me in, on their, on their team. team. But, but, but I, but I, I didn't I get reward of my own hard work. hard work. Well, I'll tell you, the, the CI community in general generally falls into two camps. This is personal ex- experience and opinion. One camp are what we refer to as the Colonel Flags, which are the, the ultra right wing America, whatever, you know, everybody's a commie and, and you know, they see the world as, in terms of absolute black and white. It's either, you know, our way or the highway. Um, interrogators are shit. Uh, the headquarters guys are all shit. Uh, we're the focus. We're, you know, you've got that group. And then you've got other folks that are pretty decent. The problem is that first group tends to be the group that controlled the field. So if you want to get promoted or be in with the in crowd in the CI world, you kind of have to, if nothing else, at least fake that worldview. Um, I think that was part of your problem is the true, call them true believers or whatever you want to call them, Colonel Flags. That's what we called it. In the interrogator world, we referred to those guys as Colonel Flags. If, if people don't know the reference, there was a character in MASH who was the CIA guy who was one of these ultra commie killer, you know, uh, hated Hawkeye and, and the guys because they were so liberal or whatever. You know what I mean? So you had that kind of group. Um, they controlled your MOS. And so to get ahead, you had to be in with the in route, so to speak. Not, yeah. that's, and now that's human nature. That's not just this field. That's pretty much <laughs> everywhere in the world you go. It's just for the question you asked to me, that's the specific driver that caused your NCOs to maybe not be as good as they should be because uh, they were meeting the requirements of that first group, not necessarily how to be a good sergeant or how to be a good leader. So it was it was a problem. <laughs> so this is a question I, I've, I've been dying to ask you for a long time. So, um, oh, do you want to say something else? Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm no, I'm just saying the other issue is that um, the counterintelligence world in general never accepted, never. So before you came on board in, I'd say, 1980-ish was when, before then, a counterintelligence agent in the Army never wore a uniform. They didn't even probably own them. They never were in uniform. Your training wasn't in uniform. At Huachuca, you didn't, you didn't wear your uniform when you went to class. Everything was in civilian clothes. And then they changed it to put a more tactical approach on it. A lot of the leadership that you had in CI still, and we're talking, what, 1990-something? So 10 years later, still could not accept the fact 
that they were in uniform in tactical units in Humvees. Just could not, that's not what a CIA agent does. And there's, I'm sure there's still people today in the CIA world that think that way. Um, but that was, a, that was a doctrine change that was never accepted in the field. That was also part of the problem that you had. So what would make a good NCO or a good warrant officer in that sitting in your field office doing field office work, you know, checking up on, you know, spying and all the other stuff that we would do, you know, the, the counter the true counterintelligence work, uh, that doesn't translate well to a tactical field. So that's right. also sure. part of the issue. So the, so I want to give two things in here. So one, uh, when you became our first sergeant, you took over from another dude. Um, you started encouraging us to go to the brass rail, which was just up the road at the other concern. And then you would always have him play secret agent, man. And you, you tried to make like at, CI people don't want to hang out together. Like that's just not in our nature. And, and we're all in field offices. Anyhow, I was at headquarters, just trapped, trapped in headquarters. It was horrible. With a bunch of, uh, and I'll say it honestly, with a bunch of mediocre NCOs, I had to counsel my own NCO because he wasn't counseling me once a month, right? So you and I go to the, um, I'd won every, I'd won every board I ever sat in front of. And so we went up to the uh, soldier of the quarter for the brigade. And you were the battalion sergeant major in this case, and Sergeant Major Drost was the brigade sergeant major. He was, he was filling in. And he was like, oh my God, you wiped up the room. Now, one thing was, is uh, you guys did the board on the other side of the wall and I could hear some of the questions. And so I had that advantage. But hey, if you're not cheating a little bit, you're not trying. We, we, um, we went for a run and on our run after this fantastic win, you said Sergeant Major Jost asked for your promotion packet, right? And then um, it, my NCO, my immediate NCO never, never put one in. And so I was like, it really broke my heart in terms of like working hard and trying to be a great soldier because here I had this thing where I'd done well. And by the way, I was never, uh, brought back to win or compete for soldier, soldier of the core for the year for the brigade. It wasn't invited back for that. Someone else was given it. They were a brigade soldier, of course. And all of these things were things where I'm like, why am I, why am I killing myself trying to be a great soldier? If, if, um, these cards are stacked against me. I can't win at this game. Mm. That's surprising. Um, I, I don't have an answer for you. Um, I was your first sergeant for not very long. I showed up in September and we were, I was a sergeant major by November. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't, I didn't spend a lot of time running the company. Uh, Chaz came in and he took over. And uh, so didn't, I, I don't have an answer for you. I really yeah. don't. <laughs> Well, it was, well, it was, it was, it was just, we did have these yeah, poor leaders like Paul Norwood. You know, he said that this deployment won't slow down careers. And then absolutely, like, didn't take care of, like, my supposed to be specialist fuller. We're going to go to apply for OCS. We had to go back to Germany. And we had it wired so that we could do it in 72 hours, round trip, you know, and uh, denied. You know, <laughs> I never got yeah, to go on leave or pass. I never got to go on path. You know, all, all these things that I could have done, done to invest in my invest career. In my career. Is that a CI that's thing? A CI thing? No, that's an army thing. Um, by all means, that's an army thing. I've been in units like that too. Um, not very many, luckily. Um, but yeah, that's that's army. You, 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 your experience in the army. Your listeners are out there that are army listeners. That half of them will have similar stories to tell or more. Uh, today, the kids call it the E4 Mafia. What you were in. Um, that's, that's the term they use and it's right. That's who runs the army is the E4s. And, yeah. uh, yeah. and the same thing, you know, if you're in that mafia, then the people above you in the food chain aren't real happy about it. I'll tell you this. Um, I always, I, I'm a firm believer that if you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. Always find somebody, always want to find good talent. I always did that. I always went out of my way to if somebody could do something better than me, promote us, promote them. That's what I want. You know, if I'm in charge of a unit and I'll say this about a lot of people didn't like Colonel Vivon, um, but he absolutely knew what he knew and what he didn't know. And he absolutely let people who knew what they were doing, do their job. Okay. He had no fear of not being the smartest guy in the room. Uh, and that's rare for a battalion commander. You don't see that very often. He had other issues, but that's neither here nor there. But I'll, I'll give him that. He was, um, he absolutely knew how to command. And he knew, he knew how to make people do what they were good at doing and give them the authority to do it. On the other hand, if you weren't very good at what you were doing, 
you had a problem with him. He was not very forgiving of people that were not competent at all. So, but that's okay. I don't have a, I didn't have a problem with that, but other people did. I didn't have much of a problem with him, but I, I did notice certain traits with him. One, so I, I sat down and the, the new, the new battalion is either XO or three came in and Colonel Vivon says, Hey, you welcome to Colonel Wood or, or Major Wood. And uh, you're like, you notice he's a major and I'm a colonel. We joined the army at the same time. We've gone to all the schools together, but I'm the commander and he's not. And I, I as an E4 sitting there on day one of this unit, I'm like, this guy's an asshole. You know, I can't trust this guy. The other thing he did that really damaged his reputation with me was he said, if I find anybody bringing summer boots on their deployment to Bosnia, instant Article 15. He and I are tossing the ball in Lukovac. Guess what he's wearing on his boots in January? He's wearing, he's wearing jungle boots. Wearing jungle boots. That uh, stuff I don't recall that either. I oh, oh, yeah. Oh, I do. I remember looking at that going, cannot trust this guy. Cannot trust this guy. You know? You know? Um, I don't recall either of those conversations, so I can't speak to them. But um, uh, Yeah. I, I packed my summer boots. <laughs> and besides, we're, we, we, you, you, my wife could put anything in a box and it would be, yeah. I'd have it the next day. Or two days from then. So, oh, wait. oh well. It's just too close. It's just too close. And it's hard to trust the community that says one thing, thing and does the other. You know, you can only get so many of those shots. Yeah. 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 All right. So All right. enough about that so stuff. About that Let's stuff. talk about some of your background, your background before Bosnia and everything, everything else. You've, you've done so many fascinating things. things. Let's get into some of your – what's interesting what's about Larry Stewart? Well, so go all the way – wind it all the way back to the beginning. When I joined the Army, it was 1979. 1979 – here's what people forget about 1979. We had inflation over 12%. The price of gas had not doubled, it had tripled, okay? When I started driving, when I was 16, gas was 32 cents a gallon. When I joined the Army, gas was a dollar a gallon, okay? That's a tripling of price. So a lot of what's going on in the world today was going on back then. Life sucked. The Army sucked. The Army sucked so bad, it was a well-known catastrophe. So when I joined the Army, I was joining this absolutely dysfunctional organization. Now. If you're a smart ass like me, that's good news. Okay. So I'm a 19 year old punk, got no future, dropping out of college, not doing well. Uh, you know, you name the, the, the tome. Okay. That was me. Um, I get one piece of advice from a friend of my father's. He says, listen, when you go to basic training, regardless of where you are, or what you do, take your weapon apart and start rubbing on the receiver group or something. Just sit there and rub it. When the drill sergeants come looking for trouble, they will not mess with you. They'll think, oh, that dude's cleaning his rifle, leave him alone. So I did that and it worked like a champ. And I was astonished at how stupid these people were that I was dealing with. The drill sergeants were all stoners who didn't care. They were leftover hippies from Vietnam that were just now drill sergeants. The training was great. I mean, it was the same training that everybody else got, but it just, we didn't have a lot of the BS that you get in basic training. It was really not much. But on top of that, here I was not doing anything. So I got a reputation in basic training of being that guy, of the one that everybody said, do what he's doing, you know? And um, so I learned very early on as a young punk in the army, you know what, if you just make a pretense of doing some of the things that on the outward look good, you're gonna go far. S similarly, I started running, right? Because if you're running, nobody's gonna mess with you to the point that, you, you know as well as I do, when I, was at, uh, when I was there, nobody would come into my office between 11 and 1 because I wasn't there. I was out running. Everybody in the battalion knew it. Don't mess with him. He's not going to be there. He's going to be out. And what they didn't realize is for me, that was I was having a good time. I was just out for two hours every day in the middle of the day enjoying my day. And, but to the Army, that was like, you know, that was great. Why can't you all be like Specialist Duke Manowitz over there? He got 300 on his PT test. Yeah, because... If I, I could do that or I could go clean out the conics, what do I want to do? You know, go to the gym or, you know, clean off a Humvee. <laughs> so that was my exposure to the Army coming up. And um, luckily, I fell into the, the interrogator world where I learned languages. I happened to be pretty good at it. So it was a skill. And then even more importantly, rather than get assigned to a Fort Hood or a Fort Bliss or something like that, my first assignment was an actual live real world assignment in Berlin, um, 
dealing with escapees from the East, escapees and refugees. Um, so I literally, when I got to Berlin, they took all my uniforms away from me and I wore civilian clothes for the next four years. And that's what I did. Also, I met my wife there. My wife worked for British intelligence. I don't know if you remember um, Denise. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, she worked for British intelligence in Berlin. So we met and, and got married and we're still married. So, you know, there's something to that. Um, but my career was, other than that, um, a lot of teaching and a lot of uh, frontline units. I never served. The first time I served in a staff position was when I became a command sergeant major. And even that is technically, I mean, it is staff, but not really. I never served at a staff ever, um, schools or functional units. So I had a pretty good career. Uh, and the reason I left is for the same reason. I didn't, I didn't like being a sergeant major. It, it wasn't fun. Um, it was all of the shitty things you have to do as an NCO, none of the fun things. So when I got promoted to E9, I had to make a choice of, do I really want to commit myself for another at least three years, probably four, for $30 more in retirement? Or do I get out now at 20? So made the right decision in that case. But And had I, had I accepted the E9 promotion, I'd still be in because 9-11 happened and I would have still been in probably so <laughs> who knows but that's kind of you know my career where i came from i you know here there everywhere hawaii texas and i was sentenced to fort hood for two years and you know typical nothing out of the ordinary yeah yeah would you say that you okay there's two things i want to say one uh, as an e4 and in working at headquarters and being a strong duty body i uh, learned that i could protect myself by carrying things at all times. And then I realized I didn't have to carry heavy stuff if I just carried a broom. And then I hyper, I hyper like a fish. If I had a garbage bag and walked briskly, I was invisible. Nobody wants to talk to a guy with an empty garbage bag. So that made me invisible. The other thing I wanted to say is the best piece of advice I got in the army from an NCO was Nancy Richards. She said, hey, you're behind this curve of promotions. You're never going to get in front of that wave. You're always going to be behind it. So you either have to branch into something else or she's like, why don't you get out and figure out if this is what you want to do and come back on your own terms. And that's what I did. I came back as a contractor, DA civilian, and I got to work at the ground level for most of my Iraq and, and Afghan ex experience. I didn't have to, I got to be a commander's advisor, his direct couch sitting buddy to rub ideas off of. I never could have done that as an E6 or a W3 or whatever, because I would have been stuck in staff and I sure as hell didn't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah, people kept asking me, why didn't I become an officer? Why didn't I become a warrant officer? And I say the same thing, because the fun jobs, as an interrogator especially, the fun jobs are the enlisted jobs. You don't have any fun as an officer. None. None. <laughs> In MI especially, there is, there is not a single MI officer job that I look at that I would say, I want to do that. I, I'm staggered that we had officers that were willing to go do it. It was not fun. Whereas we were having fun. Hell, I was having too much fun in some cases, but <laughs> um, but that's one reason. And then the other reason, like I said, when you start looking at the the uh, the dollars and cents, the, the difference in the path you took versus the path if you had stayed in 20 years, you'd probably be where you are today. The only tangible benefit I get from 20 years in the military is the medical that I get, which is I'm lucky enough to live near a major hospital and major VA center. Um, so it's phenomenal, but that's it. I mean, the, the retirement pay, I don't even see it. It just goes in the bank and whatever. It's not that much anyway, but it's, you know what I mean? It's, it's, um, you'd probably be where you are today if you had stayed in 20. Yeah. 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 In your field. Say it again. Say it again. Sorry. No, I say you, wouldn't be, you wouldn't be far from where you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have no regrets about no everything. Everything worked out the way it was supposed to. And I got to have a very unique career and, and got to do things that I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. I mean, how many people get to work on the ground level for years and years and years and never like go up and work teams and ops and analysis and stat? Oh my gosh, I didn't have to do any of that stuff. It was, and it made me uniquely qualified to do what I did at like, look, I got multiple degree black belts in what we do go out and gather information. And, and so, yeah, that wouldn't have been afforded to me if I had stayed on Army path. I want to ask you this. What's, what's the coolest what's the job, job that you had yeah, in the Army? You're like, like, I can't like, believe I can't believe that. My first job in Berlin, when I got off the plane and they took me to where I was going to live, 
I lived in a mansion in uh, a, a suburb of Berlin called Zellendorf. The mansion I lived in was expropriated from Albert Speer, who was one of Hitler's ministers. I lived in this mansion. I had a putzfrau, I had a maid. There were seven of us living in this building. Uh, I owned our, the, the organization I worked in was called the Joint Allied Refugee Operations Center, which is a great euphemism for, if you came over that wall into Berlin, we got you first because it was an occupied city. So we were the allied commandantura. I had a car, a Ford Taunus. I had a, a thing on the visor I could flick down. We called it a get out of jail free card. I could park this thing anywhere I wanted to in the entire city of Berlin and couldn't be touched. If I had to go pick somebody up at Tegel, I'd pull up on the sidewalk. <laughs> Imagine in front of the terminal, I'd pull up on the sidewalk on the terminal, flick my visor down and go inside. You know, it was one of those kind of jobs. Um, Clothing allowance, you know, I was wearing nice clothes. When my wife met me, she didn't know I was a E4 in the army. She thought I, she didn't know what I was. I was this guy in a suit that was, you know, uh, in, you know, dealing, you know, helping refugees or working with refugees. That's all she knew. Well, oh, I shouldn't say that. She knew exactly what I was doing because she worked for my British boss. But, it, but that's who she knew. She didn't know what an E4 was or what a specialist was or whatever. She had no clue. If I had told her I was the equivalent of a corporal in the British Army, she probably would have never talked to me. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? So that was, and it was a real life mission. Uh, Brezhnev and Carter had just signed an agreement to allow all the Russian refusenik Jews to leave the country. So they all came to Berlin for the most part, like 20,000 of them at once. So I had a live mission where I was interrogating every day for eight hours a day. And then I was also working at the Marienfelder refugee camp. Then, to make it even better or worse, depending on how you look at it, in the middle of that tour, the interpreter at Allied Checkpoint Alpha, which is in Helmstedt on the border, died. And they needed a replacement to go there and operate as the Russian interpreter at the checkpoint, at the Allied Checkpoint. So I did that for about six months where um, I was the interpreter. I, when shit went wrong on the road between Helmstedt and Berlin, I got in a I got in a Volkswagen thing and drove out to wherever the problem was and solved the problem. Uh, that was kind of cool. Now that I would have to say that was a tough job, and I was I had a bad attitude because I was a young punk at the time, and I had to put my uniform back on, obviously, and I had to operate in uniform, which kind of pissed me off. I'm 21 years old, and I was having a great old time. And now I'm back being a soldier, but it was still a really cool mission. And it was, it was, um, it was important. It was a real live important mission. You know what I mean? It was, we were, yep. we were doing something every day that made, that had meaning. Um, something as simple as if we couldn't get the um, atheist trucks through that checkpoint into Berlin, nobody ate meat that week. You know what I mean? That's, that's the kind of stuff we were doing. But that job, that Berlin Brigade job, that's the most fun I've ever had of anything I've ever done, to be perfectly honest. That was amazing. That's like you said, I remember looking around at my room when I got there. In, I'm in this beautiful mansion. I'm in this room. I got a balcony built into the roof of the house. And I'm sitting there thinking, I don't believe this. This is like a spy novel. I cannot believe they're paying me to do this. That was astonishing. Yeah, I love that. I love that. We have we all have these stories where we get these incredible things. I uh, I have one about MWR trips and and uh, Doctor Zawas from Egypt, and I was his main point of contact, and I had no responsibility at all, just to kind of make sure the CIA agents like they were young, didn't do anything crazy, and so like literally, I got to just hang out with this dude and and get the uh, Egyptian education of a lifetime. I, I wanted to uh, ask you this too. There's people think that interrogators they have a lot of misconceptions about interrogators when, when you have a real pro and you you know you see people on tv how does any of that can you kind of compare and contrast against like myths and actual capability yeah so um here's what i would tell you first of all is the actual title is interrogator translator we never in the army and probably to this day spend enough time on the translator part i you, you probably know as well as I do, my mission in life in the Army was to do language training for everybody. We could teach everything else we needed to teach a soldier, but language was the, the biggest thing. Um, that to me was the, the most important, was the language training. We had to do the language training as interrogators. 
And we always downplayed the translator portion. And you got to have those guys. Nobody else has them. It's the only job in, in any service, by the way. The other services don't have interrogators. It's a, in the Marines, it's a CI task. It's a, T, it's a CI sort of trailer. You get trained for it, and then it attaches to your, what they call an MOS. Navy has none. The Air Force, it's OSI guys, and believe me, they're, I, mean, I didn't want to get going on that. But um, the, we're the only ones. And we put too much emphasis on the interrogation piece and not so much on the, on the translator piece. That causes, when you show up at like Fort Hood, Texas, 1st Cav Division, you're in a Seawee Battalion. There's four of you. There's a warrant officer who's, let's just say he's, a, you, you, you would know that you, you've got your average warrant officer, and I mean average. <laughs> you've got your average NCO, and then you have two punks, okay? You know exactly what's going to happen. One's going to be the battalion commander's driver. One of them's going to be working in the S3 doing stupid shit probably OERs, okay? The NCO is probably going to become your ops officer inside the, the G2. And the warrant officer almost exclusively would become the property book officer to the point that almost it, it, it's, it's a disease among these guys. I had a warrant officer, a CW4, show up when I was stationed to the 25th Infantry Division in Hawaii. CW4 shows up, goes up to the battalion commander and goes, hi, I'm your new property book officer. He goes... God. No, you're not. You're a Russian linguist. You're going to the interrogation platoon and you're going to be a warrant officer in that platoon. No, no, no. I'm your property book officer. He goes, no, I got a, I got a supply officer that does that. That's not you. No, no, no. I'm your property. That's all I know how to do. And that was literally the only thing the guy could do because he'd been in nothing but seaweed battalions where that's what he did. He was an officer. And so they made him the property book officer in the S4. Um, that's what happens to interrogators. In a perfect world, there would be just a unit of nothing but interrogators that could train, but we don't live in that world and we never have and we never will. Um, same thing with CI agents. In a perfect world, you'd have a company or a battalion of CI agents that were then controlled from that level, but we don't live in that world. So you, you, you play the hand you're dealt. <laughs> That's true in life, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, it is true in life, and it is the hand that you're dealt. And uh, the 165th doesn't exist anymore, and, and probably doesn't need to. If Pete was in charge, I would make sure that our our CI assets were out. Like I'd push them out, TDY to go be in foreign places so they could learn to do that. And I don't know if we agree on the means and the method, but I 100% agree that our ability to work with a linguist, whether they're an interpreter or they're a, a, an interrogator, kind of you know double jobbing and everything. I hear people talk about this. These people that have career length like deployments and, and they're talking at 10 level tasks. Like that interpreter is you. And it's also your partner, the person you're talking to. And if you don't recognize that, if you treat them like a machine and say, you say exactly what I say, ignore all of your cultural understanding, you know, you're not only wrong, you're harming, harming the mission. This is just Pete's world, but you're welcome to comment on that. And then the other thing I want you to ask you about was when did Berlin stop being the Super Bowl for spies? So the answer to your first question is we interrogators got an afternoon of training on how to be interpreters. Believe it or not. I believe it. Your job title is interrogator translator, and you get four hours of training on how to be a good interpreter. That's the army. Okay. That should have been a two week class immersed where you spoke the line, nothing but the language and you learned the questions you learned how to deal with, a, a, you learned how to be an interpreter because there's you have to there's that is a skill that you have to learn. There is my master's degree is in teaching foreign languages. I got it at the Monterey Institute of International Studies, which is uh, where UN interpreters go to train. They have entire courses, master's degrees on how to be an interpreter. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it, it's a skill, and we did nothing with that skill in the army. We sent them to. DLI for 47 weeks and then assume that was enough. And it wasn't. So oh, the second question, what was the second question? Uh, when did the Berlin, when did Berlin stop being a Super Bowl for five months? It probably still is. Okay. Um, there's, there's probably assets buried in that city that we, we don't want to talk about and we will never talk about. Um, I have, I've been out long, I've been out longer than I was actually in service. I've been out 25 years. I was only in for 20. 
there are still two programs that I know are still out there that will be made public at some point that I still can't talk about. And both of them have to do with Berlin. And that's 40 years ago. Um, it, it will probably always be it physically, the geographical location of where it is is important. What's going on in the world today makes it more important. Um, people don't realize how big Berlin really is. It's huge. I believe it's the largest city on continental Europe. I'm pretty sure it is. Moscow may be slightly bigger. It's a big city and it is pretty far east. People don't give credit. It's on the eastern part of Germany. It's not in the middle of the country. So it is a very eastern focused city. So it's probably going to be the center of the Intel world for a long time to come. Love it. So I want to ask you, about, ask you about the interrogator interpreter aspect of it. And again, not, every, not all interrogators. Not all interpreters are interrogators, right? So a couple of things I know about this. We treat this process like it's what we I would say fan fire. Like here is an interpreter, you talk at the talk at the other person, and then the training is over, right? So if you're a person, here, here's the uh the context. Every operator, like a special forces SEAL, I've asked all of these guys, and save one, I've said, um, have you shot more rounds in combat or have more conversations? And they have all said, that's <laughs> with conversations by far, right? But where is the bulk of the training? It's always like on silencers, what kind of scope you have, this distance, this kill house. But there is not a kill house for guys like us to go into and be pushed to our limit, learning all these different techniques that doesn't exist. And so when that commander, and, and Pete would submit that commanders shouldn't be primary engagers with locals because they're not qualified to do it. They should have a Larry, they should have a Pete. And then before you engage, you should have a, a one-week course on how to use an interpreter, one-week course for the interpreter on how to be an interpreter. And then, a, a, just like sniper school, how do you two work together as a team so that wherever you go, if you get us an uh, unqualified person, you can bring them up to speed doctrinally on how to do this, whether you're the engager or you're the interpreter. That is, not, that is a three-week process over the course of however much time you have. Not that hard. We don't give it, like you said, we don't give it four hours. Yeah, some units do. Um, so I spent four years in the 25th Infantry Division, Light Infantry on Hawaii. Uh, the MI battalion there was not a Seawee battalion because it was Light Infantry Division. It was, very, it was a very heavy, human, organized uh, battalion. It had, you know, the human company had a 40-man interrogator platoon. It had a 40-man CI platoon. It had a 40-man ground surveillance radar platoon. The electronic warfare company had 200 people in it. The, the, uh, the LURS mission, the LURS was a company bigger than the one we had in the 165th. This was a huge battalion. We actually had a mount site where we would go in and do cordon and search with the uh, infantry soldiers. We would play the bad guys for the most part, but that was also part of our training. We would be the guy that you would have to do with the interpreting for. And I would send my, I was the platoon sergeant and the first sergeant of the company. I would send my interrogators out to do interrogation with the, with the, the soldiers, the uh, infantry guys. And then I would have one of my other guys playing the bad guy in the same, it was either Russian or Korean. Those are the two languages we had. So we would do that. And I would tell the guy that was being the bad guy to do something stupid just to see what would happen, you know, pull out a gun or yeah. see the reaction. And then we'd, we'd talk through it with everybody. It got to the point that when, the, when an infantry battalion left uh, the 25th to go do a real world mission, and we, did, we had the entire Pacific and we had guys everywhere, they said, where's my MI guys? Where's my CI team? Where's my interrogator? Where's my translator? They, they expected us to be with them. Um, you, you were part of the team. They trained with you. They knew who you were. You ate their food. You got wet with them. Uh, even me as a first sergeant, because we were, I, I, loved, I would do it anyway, I would go out on patrol with some of these guys, you know, just because it was, I'm perfectly honest, Light Infantry Division is a hell of a lot more fun than what we were doing in those heavy divisions. It seriously is. I mean, honestly, as a soldier, everything that you need for the 10 days you carry with you, you load on the helicopter, they fly you in, and then you march home after 10 days. It's like, and when you're done, when you get back from the field, you're out in, in 30 minutes. You, you've got, you know, 80 people cleaning one Humvee, and then you clean your weapons and you go home. Amazing difference. But uh, so that's my, that's life tip number two. If you're in a soldier and you want a job that's a little more soldiery, go to a light infantry unit. <laughs> I love it. You'll get, you'll get all the infantry training you want. 
Do you want to ask me <laughs> anything before, before, before we wrap it up? Yeah. So, um, you, how long have you been doing this? Uh, the, coming up on 10 years. on 10 years. 10 years. That's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. So, like I said, I've, I've been listening to your podcast. You, you, your, your family situation's good. Everything's okay from that perspective. Uh, um, commiserations. I, I heard about your brother. So, uh, my, my condolences. Um, that's not good. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it, suffice it to say that that's still happening today. Um, I spend, um, because I'm dual eligible, I do go do some medical things over at the VA and I get to see some of those people that are still, um, you know, 20 years younger than me that are having serious problems. So yeah. Yeah. We, they need all the support we can give them. No questions asked. Yeah. yeah. And with that, let me yeah, say that the brave, the brave. Save the brave.org. You can contribute. We're about to do our ride. This is what we work on. Uh, Save the Brave stepped up. My brother passed away as part of support of supporting the family. And because uh, we know that, that as much as we want to prevent these suicides, they're going to continue to happen. We have to deal with the aftermath as well. So save the brave, save the brave.org. Hit me at PDA. Pete at breakitdownshow.com if you want to understand how to get involved and contribute. I'm trying to raise money for fuel for the trip because gas is expensive. So uh, talk to me offline about that if you're interested in, in supporting that. Support Larry, that. anything Larry, closing? Anything and this has been a great hour. I've really enjoyed it. Oh, no. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. I'd be happy to come on board and talk to you anytime. This has been fun. All right, stand by. All right, stand by. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly. Thank you so much.